And we are live. Welcome, folks, to episode 3309 of the Survival Podcast. It is my great pleasure to have Jeff Lawton on the show. Haven't had Jeff on as a guest in quite a long time, but he spends an awful lot of time uh, answering y'all's questions for the expert council, which we all really appreciate. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. I know you had to get up early uh, because it is tomorrow already where you are. It's the afternoon of the day before here. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a cool morning here in subtropical northeast Australia. And um, uh, we've actually at last got a little bit of cloud, so it won't be quite so cold tomorrow morning. But we've had really clear skies, which means cold mornings. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great to be here. It's um, I'm glad you're okay with my uh, expert podcast questions. I had a bit of a spell a couple of times and I had to hit you with a waterfall. Yeah. But, uh, I always try and make it if I can. Yeah. Um, don't mind at all. Well, you're a globetrotter, so, you know, they're going to have background noises at times. I appreciate that you always make time to do it. Um, on that, just for people that maybe are tuning into their first episode of this show or first one with you on it, can you tell people just a little bit about your background, who you are, and how you got into doing permaculture? Uh, um, I've been involved for a long time. Um, I first came across permaculture in 1980 in Australia. Um, so it only became a taught subject in 79. And um, it was um, um, it was a small movement to start with because uh, Bill Mollison, who founded it, only allowed people to teach who'd already taken the design course. So it was building momentum and it hadn't got to that exponential function sort of acceleration it's on now. Um, where everybody seems to know about it and everybody's interested in getting sustainable design. So I've been involved from very early, uh, uh, in the early times. And, and um, I was 16 in 1970, I try and remind people. So <laughs> I, I, I lived through the 70s as a young teenager, becoming 20-year-old. And, and uh, we had dreams of this self-sufficiency stuff and we had, where the first inkling that the world was going astray as far as environmental damage and everything else. And, um, but it, it did, well, there wasn't any approaches that we could use. And then when I came across permaculture, I was like, hold on, this is a rational design science that you can just apply. Hmm. And if it works, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take off. So I just invested, you know, what time I had in it and it took off. And eight years later, I became a teacher which is a huge amount of time compared to what people do now. I mean, I get people teaching very quickly now. Um, and then once I started teaching, I found I had a natural ability to get people active. I was interacting with Bill Mollison, the founder, again, because he'd moved closer to my region of Australia. And um, he offered me work. Um, somehow he could see that I had some kind of ability that was worth pushing. And... Um, and it just accelerated from there. And now I'm an international teacher, uh, consultant, designer. Um, I design eco villages and um, I'm involved in carbon neutral um, town planning and all kinds of major stuff. But I still design urban blocks of land. Um, I'm very involved in not for profits. I've set up charities and um, uh, trading trusts and charitable trusts. Um, I have long-term projects, particularly in drylands. Seems ha somehow I've ended up in drylands. I started off in the Amazon um, and then went from some of the wettest zones to some of the driest zones, like a challenge. Got one. Um, and um, my Green in the Desert project now is at 23 years old, and I'm still going back regularly to keep that rolling. It's been an example um a value because people look at it and go wow if you can do it there you can do it anywhere which has been a very common statement and um i'm i'm people maybe don't realize i'm very much involved in setting up local community groups um i think it's essential that we work in local government areas and, and affect local government uh law making decisions um although you don't necessarily have to trust them but you have to influence them and, um, uh, or sneak I'm, around them. I've, I've heard some of your somewhat uh, subversive uh, techniques at times where you've just slid in some that, things that, like trees in a nature strip or, or whatever. That, and and, and we're, we're working now on 
um, a local permaculture startup kit for people. You have 19,000 local government areas in North America. We have 473. <laughs> and um, and um, we're setting up a sit system where you can just join, like you just join up the dots and, and it'll all work for you. And you can get um, local community resilience because we'll share species, we'll share systems, we'll share everything. Um, and um, by... And, and new people approaching a group like that feel uh, that they can set up very quickly and we can be very, very resilient. But also we influence the, the people who uh, are voted in to make decisions for us. And we represent what we don't want and what we do want. Um, and um, in, in, in North America, you can have it as a not-for-profit tax deductible gift, gift recipient as well. Um, we have a very large website. Uh, which networks all this sort of thing together called Permaculture Global, and it steps into its own on those systems. So um, that's something I'm, I'm very much involved in and wanting to extend across all democracies, if you want to call them democracies. Because gotcha. gotcha. that's yeah. where they work. I mean, there's legal systems set up in democracies to allow people to have sports groups and community groups and there's already the laws in place for you to operate and and there's ways you can operate in those systems and still have very radical influence awesome so one of the things that we kind of reference there is you do travel a lot and when i saw some of the stuff that you were putting out while you were recently uh in jordan for greening the desert and you got down in like oman uh and some other places i was really really fascinated can, can you kind of like start off with like a, a, a basic uh, trip summary? Like what were your goals going in? Because it seemed like these really ancient systems, I think one was like a thousand years old and one was like 2,500 years old. Like it must have been that you were targeting that on this trip. Like that's something you wanted to add to the content you were putting out. Well, yeah. Uh, like I say, I've, I've, I've worked in the Middle East quite a lot and I've worked from juxtaposed positions of, in extreme poverty and extreme environmental degradation to extreme wealth and destruction. So, you know, I've worked from the Dead Sea Valley, which was my initial location, and I'm still there, right the way out to the Gulf and rich parts of Saudi, but particularly the Emirates and the Gulf and, and carbon neutral cities like um, Mazdar City. And I've seen the extreme variation and, um, I was employed for Mazda City simply because um, I had the reputation of green in the desert in Jordan. And I noticed they were using my, they were using all my footage, they were using all my information, they were using all my films, and and the landscape architectural team I was working for were insecure about that, and so they, with their power of research, they went and sent. Um, a documentary team into into Oman and documented stuff that I hadn't seen. Uh, Oman's got some very um, rugged high mountains, and um, and that's what got me curious to research Oman, the country Oman. Um, Oman joins on to southern Yemen and Saudi on the inland side, and the Emirates up on the eastern. And northeastern side, um, and it's an odd country. It, it's not small; um, it's a reasonable size, um, but it, it's kind of had this reputation of not being, not developing the same way, um, developing with a lot more sensitivity to its cultural history and its environment. So, it just you know has some things grab you, and you just like you don't know about things until you're working in a region. Then I started to research Omar and I thought, hold on a minute, it's a lot different than what I thought. And it has a climate or a graphic effect in one section. And I had to go and see that. And I had to go and see these old food forest systems. So I funded this trip myself on the way to Jordan. I had some work in Saudi, I had work in Jordan, and I had work in Hungary. So I did four countries in 55 days. Not good for your health at my time time of life but anyway and i literally went in and found this stuff and found out a lot more 
I found out a lot more stuff. Um, as you do. I mean, you know, um, and we should be funding people to do this in professionally. Agreed. So, um, what we're looking at here on this footage, uh, those those points, see those points on the skyline? See those little rock points? Yeah. They timed the stars across the sky for nighttime irrigation sequences, and they're still there. I talk about it in the video. I said, "You what? You've got these stone towers on the skyline that you can see at night. That the guys who are switching the irrigation hour by hour of you because the stars are still there. The yeah, yeah. Are still there. It's like wow. When this stars there. over this stone open this gate, basically. Yeah, yeah. You're timing Pain. your sequences through the system. You know." Um, and, and, you know, that can sound primitive, but it's it's definitely endlessly working. Uh, it, sounds, every- it sounds dramatically advanced to me <laughs> when you think about when it was built. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, was, I just picked that up because I've got a tourist guide. So I employed a tourist guide to take us through all these systems. And, and they're nice guys. And, and, and they eventually went, you want what? You want me to take you where? You want, you know, and they got it in the end. You want me to take you to these things? Oh, okay, there he is uh, in the background in reflection. Here's my tourist guide, Yasser. And lovely people, very, very polite, the Omanis. They're renowned for being very polite. So there's, there's a whole history of Oman that I start to learn. Here's a guy just doing a little irrigation adjustment on a canal to let water go a different way. Um, so... I find out Oman was not developed until 1970. They discovered oil in 62, 1962, but they did not exploit it. They didn't know how to do it. The British helped them do it. But they kind of rejected it initially. They thought, oh, we're not sure that we want to do this and modernize, believe it or not. Mm. The Sultan, they have a sultanate. The Sultan sort of was cautious. Up until 1970, nobody wore shoes. It was actually illegal to wear shoes. <laughs> only the Sultan's family wore shoes. There was hardly any tarred roads in the country, and there was only two schools, and that was for the Sultan's relations. It was really a completely undeveloped country. Hmm. Um, and yet in history, they were one of the first seafaring nations. When they got occupied by the Portuguese, they chased them all the way down East Africa in the end and all the way down the coast of, 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 of India. So they had this old ability and spirit but it's a very diverse country there's there's giant sand dunes in the north and there's these enormously rugged mountains there are some people in oman they tell me are still not contacted oh wow they're they're still up in the mountains they don't want to come down they're not interested in modern life i I don't know nothing about that some of the largest sand dunes in the world er, er, not just ergs the sand dune uh, ridge fields, but the dras, the giant dras. There's some dras in, in, in Oman, you know, which are the largest sand forms. So it's diverse, it's strange. They, they've, they've made incredible environmental laws where you can't destroy the environment. In the middle of the capital city, there's a massive mangrove estuary, which is you're not allowed to touch. That You can just about take a tourist canoe through it but you can't hunt you can't change the environment there, there's there's protection mechanisms in place it's really quite unusual they've given housing to the local people men and women men and women at the age 18 are entitled to get a block of land and build a house and and it's very nicely done i mean it's not perfect but it's much smarter it's much cleaner it's more it's more environmental they've got the largest reed beds in the world on their oil fields, they've put in natural. Oh wow! Okay, that I did not know at all. That's that's no. fascinating. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's out in the desert where they got oil. So there's this odd things that they've had this theme. You know, often people have a theme. You know, yeah. and they've stuck with it. And it's really from the kindness of the of 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 the rulers, and and they've developed very stylish stuff. It's stylish. You know? So that was odd. That was really odd. You know, I had almost the opposite when I was in Hungary looking at communist effect in Hungary. Anyway, yeah. there's this other thing. Let me just finish this one thing because I'm fascinated with it. Sure. There's this one area of, of <coughs> Oman on the coast near the Yemen border, just about 100 square kilo- 
100 square miles is tropics. Oh, wow. It's purely tropics. <clears throat> There's no tropics all the way down the East African coast till you get to Zanzibar in Tanzania, or you've got to go all the way down the Indian coast going the other way to Kerala. <clears throat> so everywhere around is completely dry Middle East, and there's 100 miles, roughly, of complete tropics because what we call in, in permaculture an orographic effect, the effect of the landscape. There's a ring of mountains going to the coast at Salala, ringing the coast. It goes about 20 miles inland and about 50 miles north and south, and it's a ring of mountains. And not only are they just a ring of mountains, the rock is porous. It's not runoff rock, it soaks. You can see tree roots going right down. Right. And it catches the rains off, at, off the Indian Ocean, and it rains in summer, and it's dry in winter. And the temperatures don't go very high in summer because it's like a tropical wet season summer. And you can be a 1,000 kilometres north in the capital, Muscat, and it will be over 50 degrees centigrade, and it'll only be 30 degrees in, in Salala. It's too wet to grow date palms. They're coconuts. There's coconuts, custard apples, you know, bananas everywhere. There, there's, there's jackfruits and mangoes. and it, 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 You could bring in a whole suite of crop, tropical species. The Emirat, the Omans, Omanis have become quite wealthy, so mostly they're Pakistani and, and Bangladeshi immigrant workers work in this area. So when you go up in the mountains, because of these porous mountains, there's 350 springs that come down to the coast. And, and now it's become popular. It's just starting to become popular with people from the Gulf, the rich people from the Gulf, Arabic Gulf, coming there for summer holidays to sure. get away from the summer heat where they normally come to the mountains of Jordan, which are cool because of altitude. Yeah. So uh, just from a permaculture teacher point of view, I had to see this anomaly. I just had to feel it. I had to feel it and, and get a fresh coconut juice and, and, and just walk around it. And, and I'm thinking, man, we could turn this into the weirdest bit of Arabia <laughs> you've ever seen. This is tropics. This is like Bali. This could be Bali. It isn't because they still have camels and they still have Arabic stuff. They have camels yeah. and goats and things. Yeah. But if you if you manage the grazing animals and control the water in a in a sort of Asian style, you could diversify this into the oddest thing. It looked like and, Thailand and, or something, you know. Yeah, um, and, and then we could show people, look, with permaculture, we can do really strange things. Give us a bit of a climate, you know. Um, you know, analog, give us some strange sort of, you know, orographic effect, and we can build orographic effects. So I just wanted that one documentation of that one, and then I was up in this stuff because this was the main objective. Find this stuff. There's a mango there going past. So what they basically did was they actually took a consultancy around the first millennium in from the Iranians, the Iranians, who were Persians then, came in and showed the Omanis how to find spring water in the mountains and, and, and mine down into the spring water in the high valleys and trap it and find the springs and then dig canals underground just slightly fallen out of the mountains and where they emerge then use gravity irrigation systems to, fertile, to, to irrigate everything. So everything here is dropping incredibly slowly. Obviously, they've concreted this canal now in modern times, but it, it for this one's been running for 2,000 years, and the water still runs today, and they've put some nice little modern adaptions in there. It's a diverse system, shaded mostly, partially shaded by date palms. There's figs going past right there. Um, there's little terraces that are water soak systems. It's an anti evaporation, very low tech, uh, very passive system. They grow a lot of animal forage because what they do is they put their animals just slightly uphill on the side of the fruit growing system. So you've got manure just above the system. You've got green material, you've got manure, and you've got 
high carbon brand material, which are the components for compost. So they're vaguely, vaguely sheet compost in the ground. And just for people that didn't watch the video that I have playing with the sound. Sorry, sorry Jack. That's just a sheet mulch of manure just about there. You're going in on, 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 date, on uh, goat manure. So yeah. they'll just plaster it and then soak it and dilute that manure down as, as liquid fertilizer. And that's their fertility. You said in the video they weren't compost, composting it. But just for people watching this that didn't actually get to listen to it in, before we had you on, they see that water flowing. That water flows year-round constantly from those springs. And they may get the impression that, you know, you're talking about tropics and orographic effect, that there's a lot of rain here. There's not a lot of rain here. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of like five inches a year or something. But they've 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 channeled it from this broad mountain area with this porous rock into these fertile areas down lower. Is, is, that's correct, right? The porous rock is in Salala. This is not so porous rock. Okay. But they've found the water channels. They've done water first. Let's find the water high up in that valley. Okay. Let's find the water where it channels naturally in the bottom and springs. Let's direct the spring water and let's drop it very, very slowly. No matter how we do it around these rocks everywhere, let's drop it so you can hardly see it moving. Then let's channel it hour by hour into passive soakage systems. And let's have a reasonable amount of diversity in what we grow, annuals and perennials. So there's fruit trees and there's crops, not just monoculture at all. Let's find level wherever we can find level and, and soak it again passively. They're almost like little rice paddy terraces almost. They hold water. And here we are, completely fertile. 2,000 years later, the water's still running. We've lost nothing. And we haven't really added the diversity we could. You could diversify this thing hundreds of times. And then you could make the compost a little bit more sophisticated. We've got that appropriate technology today. Easy. We've got that. That's easy. That's a no-brainer. I mean, they've just about lost this because of oil wealth. There's, there's a flooded little paddy there. There's the water channeling for an hour down there. There was guys directing it lower down. Mm -hmm. And every hour it changes. Now, I'm not saying we have to emulate this exactly. I'm just saying look at the example here. For 2,000 years, this soil has not had any outside additives. It's just goat manure that's positioned correctly and organic matter. <laughs> and you're losing no fertility. And you just add diversity to this and you add some appropriate technology and you've got another game. You've got a completely different game. So if we direct, there's a guy working down the bottom. He'd be a Pakistani, I expect. If you now look at the, what we've done with our agriculture, now we've degraded landscape on mass, and here's stuff that's 2,000 years old, and it's only now had some modern adaptions, like a little bit of concrete, a little bit of extra channeling. There were some clever little bits they put in. I documented it. Right? They had put some little advancements in. But, man, where did we go wrong? Yeah. So this one, this one goes for about 5K, five kilometers, like say two or three miles. By the way, they only get three inches of rain. Okay, right. three inches. I said five, I was being way over the top. Yeah. That would be a wet year, right? And and this yeah. water is able to run year round because Not of the so. efficiency. 24 7. You can't stop it. It, it yeah. cannot be stopped. There's no, the there's no off switch on it, right? Yeah. yeah. You'd have to take it to the original course in the Rocky Valley. So you've yeah. got two channels there working together. You've got the main channel and side channel going the crops. You can see in that part of the film. So when when my tourist guide realizes what we want to see, he said, oh, I know what is it, quite a big one. And I said, what do you call quite a big one? And he said, oh, there's one that's 25 kilometers long. Like, so that's 12 miles. And I'm like, what? So we went to this one, and the road runs right up the bottom of the valley. We drove for 20-odd kilometers up this system. And, and that's just the valley. The valley joins a larger valley and has multiple valleys coming into it. And I'm thinking, why hasn't somebody come and had a look at this and gone, what did they do right? And how can we do this and just extend our food systems forever, wherever we are? I mean, it doesn't matter what climate you're in. We've always said in permaculture, water, water first. Get your water right. Then get your access. 
and then get your structural positions. So that's that's kind of a mantra of approach and design. Here I am lower in the system, and the guy says to me, um, come up on top of this wall. I've got something to show you. There's a little uh, staircase. So I'm blindly first shot, not knowing where I'm going. I've got the camera in my hand. I'm just walking up there with the um, with the GoPro, and suddenly I come to a – it's like a vertical drop. Uh, look, see how far down – and, and the staircase is hanging out. And I'm like, well, I'm no, the only reason I wasn't scared for you is since the video was up, I knew you didn't fall off. I was yeah. like, I wouldn't have went up there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the channel's up on top of the wall. So yeah. they're trying to make sure it's, it's falling at the slowest possible rate, even when it comes to building a wall up there. So These are like water. downscaled Roman aqueducts. Yeah. Like when I looked at that one you're, that's on the screen right now, for those that are seeing the video version, it looks like one of the giant aqueducts the Romans built in Europe, except it's on a smaller scale. And it's basically like this little miniature river that they created. And it's I, when I saw this, Jeff, I was blown away. This is what I was like. I got to reach out. I got to get him on the air again, because this is the kind of thing that I mean we can learn from it. even if we like you said even if we don't do it the same way it's not going to be an exact emulation like if you don't learn from something when you have people that have been growing food in a place for over a thousand years without degrading their land if you don't look at that you don't care about solutions is is the way i feel because they've they've even though you look at it you go we could tweak some things add some diversity improve things they've done something right to have a civilization be able to feed itself this long without falling apart. There's not a lot of examples like this still around. Well, I kind of feel like a big game hunt and going around and shooting specimens before they go extinct. Okay. It, it's not like, if I don't get this photograph, this could go extinct. I mean, the local um, uh, Omanis have been reasonably careful. The only thing that's going to keep these things alive in the near future that I can see is tourism. Yeah. Uh, because... They kind of don't need it anymore. And I thought, if I don't get this, I might I might not be able to get it. So there's been a few things. I've even searched Google Earth for some things. I've seen things have flown in and then tried to research stuff. It's like, I just got to get this. So if we've got it in the camera, we can prove it was there. Um, otherwise, you're trying to explain things. You're not sure that, you know, is this real? I mean, did that actually happen? Um yeah, so the, these these valleys hit these bottom systems that flare out, and and the whole thing is that's all date palm overstory food forest. The whole thing with little crop gardens underneath. And I've got I've got five star hotels wanting this as their as 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 their landscape architecture now. I'm wanting this. You know, people are wanting to say this is trendy. We 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 can attract clients to this. Well, I don't care. Uh, you want to put a five, seven-star hotel, you know, surrounded by this, and it educates your clients. I don't care who we're educating. I'll go from the poorest to the richest. doesn't really matter. Um, but this, like, allows me to set those examples. Um, and, and I've only scratched the surface. I mean, you know, we need a documentary team out there doing this en masse with the right story behind it. Um, it was, you know, just me – Flying along as, as, as best I could in 10 days, I got all of this footage. Um, and um, I'm just glad I was able to get it in the can for people so they can see it. Um, no, it's pretty amazing. What I wanted to talk to you about, though, like, so we look at this and I hear from people all the time. They want to buy what they call junk land out in West Texas and all. And everybody watches videos like this and they're going to transform it. And this is an incredible amount of work. But kind of when I looked at it, one of the things I took in with my mindset was so we could emulate the water capture and flow using swales, but there's a massive catchment area creating these springs that's not fertile, right? If you look at the, the images when, when this particular reel started, it's this massive amount of green. And yet, if you look on the sides, it's no trick. Like everything else looks like straight up desert. And so... How would we go about emulating this? Because this has like a unique setup that, okay, then you find that setup and you harness it and every setup is going to be different. If, if you were trying to emulate this somewhere else that didn't have maybe the orographic effect, how might you design something like this? <laughs> well, luckily they had the whole landscape to choose from. <laughs> yeah. 
and 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 they set it up around tribes. So this is actually a tribe. This tribe still controls this particular shop we're in now. Um, but um, I was in I was just in California yesterday afternoon online because I design online with lidar, and and I was in Monterey, California, and they had two thousand four hundred acres yeah. of catchment, um, leading to three hundred acres of flat. So that was an example where. We're gonna we're gonna direct two thousand four hundred acres of property. Ninety nine percent of it is going to be directed water systems towards three hundred acres of flat. Now, not uh, last week I was in the in Texas, in southern Texas, and I've never been to this part of Texas in the Chilean desert. Okay, <laughs> right down the bottom, pretty remote area, um, and the couple had taken my online course. And they'd lived in Arizona and they, and I had to ask them a few times, did you really want to buy this? Did you know what you were buying? <laughs> it's a very rough bit of ground. And there's not a lot of services in this particular local government area. And they said, no, we actually wanted to buy this and we want to show an example. And, and it was like, okay, I, I haven't got people who were, who were, who were misguided here. They, they, they're not, they're, they're not bought something they didn't realize. They realized what they were buying. And, and it's not, not much, that much feature in it. But immediately you look at it and you say, okay, forget everything else. What's the optimistic part of this land? Where's the bit we can catch? What's the contour line that directs the initial design action? And just in the short initial 90-minute consultation, and like I said, a lot of it was verifying that this is actually what they wanted to do and they shouldn't just sell it and buy something else. They were no, no, no. We really want to do this. Okay, I found the line. Even on 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 a lidar map, talking to them across the internet, I found what I think is the line. That okay, this is probably the best planning line, and I legitimise why. And I said, go out and photograph this. Go out and photograph that. Our next meeting will be verifying my initial thoughts. Now, anything we do can increase and increase and increase the potential. You just need to drill down and focus. If you don't own the whole catchment, well, you don't own the whole catchment. That's sure. the way the government surveyed the damn land on us. Um, but it, there, anywhere you are, you can find ways to enhance the situation so it starts to go in the right direction and starts to improve. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm always surprised. I've very rarely come up with one that I think I can't do anything with this. There's nothing I can do. Um, and that's never happened so far. Obviously, one then thinks, like, if you know what you're looking for before you buy, maybe you can go, look, there's this big lump of catchment out there. No one's got any interest in it. They don't realize there's hard rock sitting right above you and all that water's coming towards you. Now, I can read that. I can teach people to read that. Now, maybe those are the ones to buy. I used to do permaculture development in the early days where I used to, uh, a friend of mine, Paul Taylor, who's passed on now, we used to go out and look for land that could be developed because there were dams, there were pond sites, there were swell sites, and there were things we can do mainframe development. And we used to go out and put ponds in, swales in, driveway, house site, nothing else, green it all up with cover crop and sell it for a profit. And mm -hmm. it was a turnover. It was flipping a property with a permaculture adapt, adapted flip. But those same properties would have been a good purchase if you want to live there. Likewise, you could look at this stuff. You could look at dry lands and go, look at the rock catchment. Uh, some of these shots, I'm showing you debris in the trees where the flood comes through. And I actually show you how they put modern adaptions to adjust the flood. You can read the flood. You can read the debris. People are shocked when I can see flood in deserts because a, a desert's a flood waiting to happen. Yeah, I and learned that from you long ago that when you design in a desert climate, you're designing to a flood. It's the yeah. complete contradictory to what you think it is because, one, you have to deal with the water when it comes, but, two, you have to harness and harvest the water when it comes because you don't get a lot of water through the year, but you get a lot of water in a few events. Because everything runs off. People are always underestimated. And I tried in Quail Springs, Warren Brush's property, Quail Springs, Upper Cuyama Valley. 
and, and I, I was advising them on gabions, and, and they were making little ga gabions with little rocks in cages. And I'm kind of like, when that flood comes, this is going to do nothing. It's just going <laughs> to get swept away like a broom. You need, you need giant rocks in this thing, and, and it's got to be another scale. And they'd never seen the flood. Well, when the flood did come, it just swept it all clean. But if we'd have put the right gabions in, we could have flicked swells out like shock absorbers on your on your suspension system. If you don't have shock absorbers in your car, it does nothing but bounce when you hit a bump. Yeah. Right? If you put shock absorbers in, you get a smooth ride. You, you can never stop the ride. It's always going to be a wild ride when you get a flood. Running across stuff like that, it's going to be a wild ride. But look at the shock absorber they put in. Look yeah. at that. That water's going to hit water. It's almost an acre of, of, of pond. Now, it's not sealed. They just put a, a long, wide gabby on at the other end and directed water either side of the valley. It's so there. It's going one side or the other side. It's just bloody rock. Huh. I mean, it's such a simple thing that they did. That's the top of the system. And 25 kilometers, 12 and a half miles, let's say, downstream, it's still rolling before it hits the main valley. For 25 years, I had to time lapse this because it was too far to walk. So I just put time lapse on and walk. Each one of these is a bathing pool. There, oh. there are bathing pools all the way around for people to wash or, or take a bath. And above this, to our right, as I'm walking now, there's the goat pens with the furious that almost rolls in, but they, they direct it. It's like, this is so simply low tech and it's held fertility. It's like, so I just I just kept rolling, you know, and just said, well, let's see what this comes out like. It's okay. It gives you a bit of an idea. I could have just kept walking for a few more hours through the same thing. Now, um, these, these systems, one of the things I thought of when I looked at is, do we need to preserve, like, the knowledge of this as you've documented? But I also wonder, like, the people that maintain these systems, I'm sure they know them intimately, but if a system's been around a thousand years, you've upgraded it, you added a pipe here, you learn how to run it. Do the people that run these systems today, would they have the knowledge to build another one? Or is that a different, a different thing? You know, like I can train somebody on how to run all, like I can have a farm hand come in here and run end to end of my farm, but they can't necessarily go make one. And a thousand years is a long time. Like, do we need to really be focused on like capturing the, the engineering knowledge of this low tech system? And then we could talk about adding stuff to it or, or what have you. We could diversify it now, but what, that, that there's inherent knowledge. I think it's in their DNA a little bit because it's many generations, but the old people know how to do this who are just still alive. The young yeah. people are on screens going to town. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're saying the same thing everywhere. And because they've become somewhat oil wealthy and modernized so everywhere we're seeing this collapse and and you talk to the there's some great old guys but they're in the 70s and 80s now and you you're talking to them and, and they go no no the young people don't get it and might come up for a novelty with dad might get it but he's not there mm -hmm. so but he'll bring the kids just to show them a bit of heritage and pick a couple of watermelons or mangoes or something but that the, the old guys are still in there and they've got the wisdom of it all um, we can break it down from an engineering point of view. We can see what it is that's happening. Uh, as long as we capture it, these are, you're absolutely right, these are absolutely intimate systems, and mostly it's not the locals farming anymore. The locals can employ immigrant workers who aren't invested so much. They're invested in the idea of going back home sometime, um, like you have immigrant workers in, in Central America and immigrant workers in America are mostly invested in going back home one day. Um, but um, we can break this down and work this out no problem, and we can add appropriate tech. Some people sort of had to go at me, oh, they've concreted some things. Well, yeah, concrete's pretty bloody convenient compared to moving all those rocks. I mean, that's what yeah, it is. Move all those rocks and dry stone wall everything. There's no skills of that much there. But a bit of concrete to get us out of trouble right now. Then they've put in poly pipe, like pol like plumbing pipe, which I found fascinating. I documented a section where they've got um, right at the headwater, they could actually take the water sideways through poly pipe um, by a little kind of 
small barrage dam at the top of the system. Now, that's obviously quite new. And, and they've gone, okay, when there's a big flood, with the advantage of this polypipe, we can set them through the concrete wall and block the main canal and take it all sideways so we don't overcharge the canal. That mm -hmm. would be saving them a lot of intimate repair jobs. So you can take all that sort of intimacy requirement out and add a bit of modern tech for now because – and we can all get intimate with rocks and rock walls later on if you want. But right now, you know what's happening out there. The shit's hitting the fan as far as food quality and land degradation is concerned. And, and what we're now going to go into laboratory food. Holy crap, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, laboratory yeah. food? Really? I mean, you think you've got health problems now. Yeah, beyond uh, beyond burger or whatever I call it, beyond belief burger. I'm not eating it. It's never happening. I, it's not a real mammoth food. burger now. The DNA from a frozen mammoth mixed with an elephant has been made into a burger. I mean, no one knows what it tastes like yet. But like, it's like you worried about control. I know some of your audience worried about control. You like put it all in a laboratory um, and then control what you're eating. Like. As long as they don't make it illegal for us to grow our own food, I don't care yeah. if they make food illegal to sell. But let's not. If you start making it illegal to, to grow your own, there's going to be two types of humans out there, the wild ones and the ones in the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm already feral. I'll go full wild in that standpoint. You'll, you'll, I'll be running around in a loincloth somewhere in the woods and you won't get me out. Like, that's not happening. The uh, thing is, the farmland's going to go so feral. The farmland's going to, you just have to hang out, hang out for a while. And the, everything that's now farmland is going to turn into such a wild landscape. Um, they're going to have a hell of a job finding us. Well, they've definitely taken a lot of really great land and degraded it to the point where it's not productive enough for their methods anymore. Mm -hmm. And that and, may in time spell opportunity because we can recover land. Like these were like way easier places to grow food than what we were just looking at. And with the techniques we know with permaculture, we can regenerate those landscapes uh, amazingly fast, especially if we start bringing uh, animals into the system. And that's one of the places that there is a segment of the permaculture community that like really doesn't want to use animals kind of full on vegan and all it's more of a, not just vegan. I don't care what people, people eat whatever they want, um, but almost like a militant vegan, like with the free the animals or whatever. And to me, and I think I've heard you say this before, like, you're not going to restore these broad scale systems without bringing animals into them because they're part of like animals belong in these systems. We hear this stuff today about, you know, we need about too many cows or whatever. There used to be 50, 60 million bison running around in North America. And before the uh, younger dry ascended, we had megafauna in North America. We had sloths the size of elephants. And so these and you know, animals, those cows go, they're going to speciate in something like a bison anyway. Yeah. The animals yeah. will come back whether you like it or not. Uh, I, was, I was just in Hungary where we've got a new project, and Hungary is very similar to um, inland North America, like Wisconsin, Minnesota. It's central Europe, long way from the ocean, cold winters, warm summers, um, much, much, much cheaper um, labor force and hard working people, and they've been ex communist since the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And then they were freed from communism, but not from the very strange communist development in their villages. But there's ancient stuff, there's ancient, ancient empire there. So we've got a wonderful project, we've got lots and lots of land, tons of fishing, so much freshwater fishing. And we went, I've just got to tell you, because you know this stuff, I'll send you a photo. We went catfishing for giant catfish. And my daughter, 13-year-old Latifa, caught a 50-kilo catfish. That's a 120-pound catfish. Oh, wow. And people fish their whole lives to get one of them. Um, it was a monster. Um, she caught three, um, one about eight pound, one about 16 pound. And then this monster, you know, they were saying, like, some guys fish their whole life get one of those. But the whole thing's full of fish. But here's something interesting, probably left over from the um, communist era. 25% of the country is forest. There's timber everywhere. There's loads of wood. But there's tons of deer. There's absolutely tons of deer. Really? So it, it's, uh, it's $3 a kilo for deer meat. You get deer meat anywhere, right? Um, 
And there's a massive hunting organization, a massive fishing culture. So lots of lots of people going out hunting. The hunting organization is national and they have to pay any losses. They have to compensate any losses for farmers, crops or, or fruit. So at the end of summer, when most crops are coming in, because it's a hot summer, cold winter, all fruit and a lot of fruit and, and, and crops come in, in in the end of summer. Hunters are everywhere making sure no crops get damaged because the cost of crop loss is worn by the registration of the hunting organization. That's that's my theory on a broad scale. I had a guy tell me one time he, he really didn't want a garden because he had to shoot six deer over his garden. I said, you have a deer garden. The deer go live on the woods, then they come in to harvest your garden, then you shoot the deer, you get vegetables and meat. What's the problem? And it's just a broad scale version of that. I love that. And I, you know, I think if you look at our natural history as, as beings on this planet, we've always been both scavenger, cultivator, and predator. Like that's what humans are. You know, that's our that's our natural niche. We just have this giant brain that lets us adapt in such a way that we have to take some level of personal responsibility as we do that because we can be like locust i was watching a, a documentary i don't even remember what it was about but it was just showing container ships going in and out of a, one harbor and i was like oh my god we're like we're like locusts on this planet but i also yeah. at the same time i was thinking but we don't have to be there's just so it much designed, it's we stop designed shipping containers to arrive just on time yeah one yeah. minute late and there's a problem and then covid made them three months late and the whole world went 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 down the can yeah. I mean, we're very clever in that we've designed this super efficiency, but it's totally vulnerable. So these guys in Hungary, they're, they're, they've, they've gone in the wrong direction, but there's ancient systems there where there's very, very cheap land. People don't want land anymore. We've bought, our organization bought lots of land. But there's these funny old systems. Um, you know, it's um, every bus stop in Germany has an apple tree planted next to it. Oh, wow. It, it has to have. It's it has the to door, have. right? If you yeah. have a bus stop, you have to at least have one apple tree so people can eat apples when waiting for a bus. Like, what oh. a crazy thing. Like, I've never seen that before. Or is it like funny little things you see, you know? Um, well, so and like, like that whole area, like where Hungary, Croatia, all that whole part of uh, Europe is, I, I don't remember who I heard this from, but I was, it, there's still some of these systems left that they're like pond based systems. But they like they drain a pond and they plant it and they graze it. And then mm -hmm. the other pond has like young fish in it. And then the other pond is like grow out that season. And those ponds revolve right. around and they're sealed with the manure from the grazing animals and then rolling over to a, a like a glee seal every season that the, that the, 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 the dry pond ends up flooded. Yeah. And like th that's the type of thing like I, I think actually Sepp Holzer was talking about that. It was like there's only a few of them left that are like that. And I just wonder how many, how many gems like that? Like you say, you're like the big game hunter going to document this stuff before it's gone. Um, yeah, we were, we were in those ponds and we're working with earth movers. They were actually building new ones. So they're real fishing culture. They got some of the best fishing tackle I've seen. And I've never seen the brands. It was one tenth the price it is in Australia. I actually bought some back and I always research fishing shops of new tackles and stuff. Yeah. But our guys there are working in Iraq um, our team there are, are some of the main lead teams in Iraq, and they're good engineers. And um, we're working in Solomon uh, in, in Solomonia, the last place that ISIS, last stronghold of ISIS. That's where we're working in Iraq. And um, recently, we've built uh, 300 chicken tractors in Iraq. Oh wow! We've got them all lined up like in a car park. They're all really solid. They're all solar powered. Uh, doors open, doors close. Uh, we've got electric net fences. Uh, we, and with all people, we've got the European Union of Churches funding our work there. Um, we're going in from Hungary with mostly Hungarian staff, uh, good, strong workers, brave people, and going out there and, and, and fertilising the desert in Iraq from Hungary. Um, so it's kind of weird what's going on. I mean, you just grab what you can grab as it happens. But um, I, I never saw this come. And I didn't know I was going to go to Hungary and catch huge fish either, you know, and eat no. lots of No, no, you're like me. You're a fisherman. Like, that's that's <laughs> wherever you go, let's let's fish. 
<laughs> yeah, well, my, I'm lucky. My whole family, uh, my, my wife and daughter nagged me to go fishing, which is good. Um, well, if you ever get to Texas, I told you I'll take you out with the catfish guides and the white bass guides. We'll, we'll make two different <laughs> days of it. You were, you were supposed to be here at Bass Draw. I was all excited. I, was, I spoke at the same event that you did virtually. And then John's like, no, he's not. I'm like, dang it. Because like you know, you mentioned Latifa is like 13 now, and that just seems ridiculous to me. Because the last time I saw you in person was in California, and she was this little thing you were holding in your arms. Yeah. I'd say yes. she was two or three years old, something like that, maybe, you know. It's been about 10 years. She'd nearly hold me up now. Um, <laughs> mind you, I had to help her with the rod on that big catfish. Oh, it, was, it was like hooking onto a small horse. Yeah. But um, yeah, we're so the thing is, like for everybody's to bring back to the audience here, <laughs> it's still exciting after all these years. You're still finding wondrous things about this planet in, in landscape, in living systems, in people's cultures. I met old ladies in Hungary that I was so impressed, like, you know, 80-year-old lady next door growing all her own vegetables, you know. Um, there, there's, there's old people in, in Oman who are running those ancient systems there's still the knowledge is still there, um, and and we need to grab some of that while we can. Um, we need to set up local um, information networks, community groups where we we grab it and we share it, and we don't centralize it, um, and we don't monetize it much. We just give it away. We get you know if we want resilience, we have to share this stuff real fast. You know. Um, because if everybody has it, then no one's going to make, you know, ridiculous amounts of profit out of it and greedily lock it all up. Yeah, and it's a delicate balance. Uh, and I want to start talking about your site, Green in the Desert. Before we go there, though, um, I do have some videos from one of your walkthroughs on it. Um, that, that, you that, plant, go ahead. that plant you just saw there has been a godsend, that that sea purse lane. Wow, you ought to look that one up. The, uh, but you'd mentioned like bringing hotels and stuff like that. And I think some of these places that are these ancient places, that is the solution. Um, you know, when they figured out like they were trying to conserve all the all these different game animals that were in danger of extinction in a lot of Africa. Well, when they started bringing hunters in and hunters paid lots of money to hunt. Then it was then the people that lived there saw a value in preserving the asset. We have a ton of exotic game in Texas, and the reason it's maintained, and these are animals like oryx and things like that, that a lot of it came from Africa, is because there is this people with money and that want to experience it pay to go there. Or the, the parks in Africa, people pay just to go drive through and see these animals. And I think it's kind of the same thing that maybe some of these areas are in desperate need of some level of tourism. Because then, like you said, these people that like I don't really need it anymore. Maybe they'll see more value in preserving it and learning about it and protecting it. Because I'd go hang out in a place like this. I mean, that's a part. Let's let's switch to kind of greening the desert. That's a part of what you guys do here. Like this is a place people can go and and just be there and see and learn from it. Yeah, this is a, an experience for people. They go and dip their toe in the water. I've you got a dog go. alert. Roll. I'll be right back. Just go. <laughs> Yeah, this this site here is is uh, an Airbnb where people can actually sleep in a in a straw bell bedroom. Um, you're running on solar power. You've got uh, grey water uh, running on reed beds, and you can check it out. It's not smelly. It's fertilising this system. Um, there is traditional landscape, so there's there's traditional systems as well as appropriate systems married to it. So we brought in assemblies of plants that make this a unique oasis, although it's an oasis. Um, the assembly of plants is, is quite unusual in traditionally. Um, Jordan didn't have what Oman had when we were shown before. Um, it didn't have that culture whatsoever. But um, this assembly is, is a functioning system completely you can feel it when you're in it you can feel the shade you can see the diversity um you can see all the different harvests but you can see how user friendly it is it, it's really nice to sit in and, and experience you know the the um the whole sort of ambiance of being in an oasis because you only got to look over the wall and you're in something that looks like the moon um we've extended it now with, with three to four blocks of land out and we have 
the state of the art house, our latest house is a very modern house showing how you can build a, a house that just about completely air conditions itself in this hot climate. It's an outside walls, all straw bale and inside walls are all mud brick. Um, we, we make all these ourselves. Um, we've got people now really experienced in this because it's been 20 years and we've refined it. So, um, they're, um, they're very beautiful buildings. They're, they're not just functional. They actually are very comfortable uh, and, and very modern and attractive. And people are all over it. They just love it. Um, the modern house it might come up in a minute. It's just coming up behind this uh, shot. Um, it actually has a spiral staircase in the center, which looks trendy. It looks great. But it actually functions as the elevated top that sticks out of the flat roof to accommodate the top of the staircase. It's got a solar chimney on the top. So it, it self-exhausts the hot air out of the center of the building through the spiral staircase. So you get a spiral staircase, but you get a function of, of, a, of a, a natural hot air exhaust in the center of the building. So that's coming up right now in the background. And um, yeah, um, and I'm actually documenting their marshmallow plant, which is actually a weed, but it's a favorite, a, a favorite spinach of the local people um, they call it Hobesa, um, and it and it germinates in winter. But our, our kitchen window in the new house looks at eye level straight into the garden, which used to be a chicken pen. That's moved. Uh, enormous amounts of trellis have been put in on the new house um, with passion fruit and grape and some jasmine just for aesthetics. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been good fun to actually take the demonstration to new levels. Um, we have an organic cafe with organic snacks, but we also have a traditional organic restaurant now. These have been funded by aid organizations because we've been successful. So, um, and, and yeah. a lot, like most of the fertility here is either from organic matter because you plant a lot of trees that are chop and drop and chickens, right? There's not, there's not a lot of other fertility here, is there? No, we bring in goat manure because it's in surplus in our region, goat sure. and fat-tailed sheep. So this used to be the chicken pen, and now it's a recycling wood uh, woodwork shop. The only wood we can teach young people to use is brick pallets. Ah. That's the only wood there is. There isn't any timber in Jordan. It's Siberian pine that most people use. So we're taking wood pallets and upcycling them, um, and uh, we've got a local carpenter training um, young guys with nice you know, battery tools and all that stuff. That's something well, you don't really think about, but yeah, I mean, you got trees everywhere here, but Jordan itself is, there's no timber. It's a, so there's people in the States and all over the world, I guess, doing stuff out of pallets because it's trendy and cool and it's hippie-esque or whatever. But it, where you're at here, it's, it's the source of wood you have. Yeah. Those are recycled uh, railway sleepers split in half on the footpath. Huh. And and there is a market in growing fast growing. You can grow mesquite, what you call mesquite, mm -hmm. and get an income up from firewood because people want to have an outside outside fire. But it's really expensive to buy firewood. And our request, you have to go with the connections. The connections here have been from our initial results. My previous project results was people wanted to come and learn and take a design certificate course. Yeah, uh, they wanted to come. So we, uh, our connection was international people wanting to come to Jordan to learn. That has continued to increase along with local people wanting to come because we have a reputation locally now. So we've converted our shower toilet block into a two-story accommodation building. It's just being completed now. It's mostly mud brick, and it's got six bedrooms. So we've, we've increased our accommodation because that's the connection that's in demand. Um, and people, you can just see it coming up here, it's still in construction, but that's two story mud brick um, with six nice bedrooms, each with an ensuite um, and um, a, a shared community kitchen on each floor. So that's extra accommodation for our students because what we started to notice was our students come in with more and more first world professionals. Yeah, those yeah. are mud bricks. So we do, we do concrete pillar 
mud brick infill. <laughs> okay. Because we're in an earthquake zone. And again, we're not shy of concrete, it's functional. But the mud brick infill between the concrete gives us the functionality. Um, it works really well to store the cool and uh, uh, over the day and that that accommodation building has verandas into the food forest i'm on the roof here looking at the surrounding landscape that's what it looks like around us yeah it, it's pretty impressive let me pull up the greening the desert site because there's a good still of it on there and it really quickly shows you that you have this island of green um what has been like this this, this place where you're doing this, the people that live around it, what has been the impact on them in seeing this happen? It looks like at least in the background a bit, there's a, a little bit of something going on um, directly behind that site where there's some trees and all. Are, are others starting to go, hey, maybe we need to do this too? Because yeah, we've gone, we've gone I, I know like when I started doing everything here, my neighbors all of a sudden were out planting trees. It's like contagious. They're... they're, they're, they're very much in a stress situation. Um, so we've gone three, we've expanded two blocks downhill, uh, one block down the road, one block across the road, and one block up the road. So you'll see a video come out about our next door, uh, our neighbour across the road. She was the, one of the first disconnected sites. In other words, the other two are connected to us. They just like melted into us. Uh, but to jump the road was quite an event. And it's a single lady across the road sending an admirable job. And I've just documented it again. Um, but um, and like, the funny thing is, initially they thought we were crazy because we moved into one of those sediment blocks, those sediment buildings, a, a claim. There was a claim on this land. We bought it off the claimant, but he left, of course, the little claim building. And we actually moved into that. Well, they're actually not usually used they're just used as a claim and then we expanded that little building for five years they thought we were crazy they just thought we were nuts um and then gradually they started to realize you get busier all the time there's more people coming and there's all these international people and you're not going getting quieter you're getting a little bit busier every year and then it started to grow with the locals the locals said well what are you doing like, what is it you're doing? Most aid organizations come in, chuck a bucket of money at the system. It looks great on the open day, and 10 years later, it's disappeared. It's just wrecked. You're getting busier, and we actually had our open day 10 years later. On the 10th anniversary of us starting was our open day, and, and there was no stopping us after that. Once we hit that 10-year period, we were gone. Now we have like 30 local staff involved. There's ladies running businesses out of here. There's neighbors running businesses. There's people running Bedouin breakfast. There's people making craft material. There's people running nurseries. Um, we've got projects all over the local suburbs funded. You know, um, I can't keep up with it. I'm, I'm, I'm just a volunteer. I've never been paid. I've done this whole thing as, as a volunteer. They pay my airfare to go and teach a course. I don't, I don't, I am taking one cent, nothing. Um, and I, I really don't know what's happening. It's I, all I know is it's looking like this, getting better and it's getting bigger and it's, and it's now national. It, it's got national recognition. It's registered with the tourist association. It's registered with the airlines. It has a complete permit to operate. Even the, the Royal family members come and visit. Um, yeah. And uh, it's great. I'm kind of, redundant although i still turn up you know um and, well, it's the mark um, of a good designer you di designed it in such a way that the people that are taking care of it were led by the the, the mainframe design and i'm sure they've done a thing or two here and there You're like i wouldn't have done that but overall they stayed with the main flow because when you set that main frame right it becomes pretty obvious i know like the first site when you left, they changed it around and basically screwed everything up. And this one, it seems like you took a lot more uh, control into at least the, the founding of it. Well, we bought the land ourselves with, and then we set started up and then we set a, a local community group. We, like, so we, we set up a local permaculture not-for-profit organization up, and we gave it to them as mm -hmm. we were pretty sure that we'd, we'd keep working together. And um, the local... Now we have young, aspiring international teachers 
moving to the site for like a year at a time to teach courses and live there. So I have young Sam Parker Davis, who's a very aspiring young teacher, he's going to be there for two years. He's in Italy right now. So from here, you can jump into Europe quite easily on a flight. You're three hours to Hungary, where our other big work is. But he, he's in Italy right now. And then he's back in the next days. He'll be there for quite a few weeks. And then he's going to Iraq and back. So this is his base. So I, I'm really very redundant now because mm. you have some really, you know, people, young teachers are going to go past me. That's for sure. Way past me. And, and so I'm kind of relaxed. Hope I don't get ill because I'm too relaxed now. <laughs> <laughs> I might just become completely redundant soon. Um, and, um, yeah, it's been my biggest focus by accident. Um, and um, we need more of the same. There's no reason why this can't happen anywhere in America, that's for sure. Um, it's only the social issues and people getting funny about money that would stop it. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing we have going for us in America is that there's plenty of places where doing things are complicated. There's codes, there's neighborhood Karens, there's all kinds of roadblocks. But there is a massive crap ton of land that you can do almost anything you want on. And there's a lot of it that you can literally do like almost anything you want. Where I live, I'm 20 minutes and I could be in downtown Fort Worth when there's no traffic. I don't even have building codes. And I think people in America don't realize how fortunate they are that we have so much land like that. Texas, basically, if you're unincorporated and you're not in whatever county Corsicana, Texas is in because of a weird thing, any other county in the state, if you're unincorporated, if you want to build a house, you need a septic permit and the government never comes back. And that kind of freedom is not as common as I think people think it is in the world. And they need to harness that. And, and, and especially you mentioned young teachers coming in. Like if I was 20 years old right now, I'd spend about four years traveling to places like this. And then I'd find a place to anchor down and do my thing. And the money issue is something if you if you're smart about it, you cherry pick your opportunities and you're committed to it. You'll always fix the money problem. It's oh, the yeah. government problem that gets in the way. And so finding a place where you can be left alone and do your thing. That's that's the money. And you hit on it with the water earlier. Like the thing I picked up for you that I always repeat whenever I'm talking to somebody like I don't do consulting. I don't like doing consulting, but occasionally I do it kind of impromptu. I'm at somebody's house or water access structure. And there's a reason water comes first. And it's the thing that makes land in the mind of a seller worthless. And the educated buyer that can solve the water pro problem can cherry pick land for dirt cheap. And I don't think people are really switched on to that as to how powerful that is. Um, yeah. Curtis Stone had to pr uh, present the same thing that I was talking about earlier with Bastrop. He had to present locally because they didn't let him in the country because they considered it a work trip and he didn't have a work visa. Um, but he did a great virtual. And he was talking about how the land he bought, there was no water and no real hope of water. And they don't get that much rain, but he could read the landscape and go, I can put a well in there and I know there's water there. And he was right. So if he had bought that land and the well had already been there, he would have paid four or five X for the same piece of land. And I think people need to start like one of the best things you can do is take a PDC because if you're going to buy land, I think that, that, that just knowing how to analyze a landscape will pay back the cost of a PDC. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I listened to a little bit of um, of Curtis because uh, I was late. That well, they were late. I was on time, and and then I yeah. had to li listen to um, um, the American, uh, the uh, Australian guy um, who has his um, energy efficient home um, in Sydney. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, the 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 consultancy I was doing in Chin. In the Ch Chilean desert, there Ch uh, is it the southern Texas, it's like Ch Chihuahuan desert. I think Chihuahuan desert. Yeah, um, yeah, they said they had no building codes. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, I guarantee uh, you, there they there's nothing. And there's yeah. not much in Jordan. There is building codes, but very little. Exactly. Here in Australia, we're in a nightmare. We're almost Californian in comparison. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean. <sighs> Uh, my my online business is is an American business. I'm registered in America, 
because um, it, it was more sensible than registering in Australia. So I don't think I can get refused a visa anymore. Um, so I think I can come in on, on, on because I have a registered business and my okay. business partner is a Harvard lawyer, so I can probably work that. And I'm wondering whether it would be popular for me to come and do a, a, a speaking tour or something. So yeah, It would, we... and you have people on the ground here that can hook that up. I'm just saying. Like, mm. that is not a problem, Jeff. I can stack people in anything with you. Uh, and so I mean, just, happily. Well, we probably could do it in the summer or something like that. You know, we could get something going where I just come over and do a few that are worth doing because um, it's not that hard. Um, I can actually land in San Francisco or LA an hour before I take off. <laughs> yeah, it works for you going. It works for you going east, and it works against you going west. You, it's always worse going home, but you yeah. forget about that on your way. Um, at least you're in good condition when you get there. You've gained an hour, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we could do that if you think if your audience wants to give me give you a response on that. Like, let us know because. Um, um, I don't mind where I go. I do like the South. Um, yeah. I like the people of the South, but I don't mind tipping the people up, up near the Canadian border either. Yeah. Um, I'll just say the weather here is best about now and going <laughs> back about two months. That's, yeah. you know, it, it gets, well, you spend a lot of time in the Middle East. So what we call hot, you might not really see, but it gets really hot here by like July, July, August in this place. Like, I made a joke one year that a couple hobbits came and threw a ring in my backyard to melt it. Like it's, it's pretty scorched earth, you know? Um, we don't get humidity though in the summer. We get our humidity now. Yeah. So it's, it's dry desert like heat in the, in the hottest time of the year, but it's, it's uh, you got to make sure if you have, if you're doing a workshop where people are working, you got to hydrate them or they'll pass right out on you. You get all these desk jockeys and stuff coming in to do work. And you're like, you got to, you put your staff on them, like watch and, one of my rules, even when we do the fall stuff here, is if somebody tells you to drink water, I don't care if you don't think you need water, drink the water. Because we've never had anybody pass out. And I've, I've seen it on, like, construction sites and stuff like that. It's uh, it's kind of brutal heat. But I'd love to have you come over here. It'd be it'd be awesome. And I, I guarantee there's people in the live feed right now that would show up. Uh, I, I, I don't mind the heat. I hate the cold. I can't okay. stand the cold. Unless you go minus 10. Okay. And then it starts to get drier. But yeah. um, my daughter's never seen snow, so she's really keen to see the snow. But snow. normally heat, no problem. Heat yeah. we can handle because we just deal with it here. And, of course, working in deserts. I was cold in Hungary, so they, they gave me some really great hunting trousers and jackets, which I brought home with me. I'm wearing them now in our window, uh, overkill. Yeah. But, no, let's, uh, let's, let's look into it. We can do it. No problem. It's a quick flight, really. Let's. Uh, uh, I, I've I've held you for over an hour, so let's uh, let kind of wrap up here. But let's uh, give kind of some promo for some of your stuff. I mean, one of the things I think everybody should do here is uh, get over to uh, your website, and uh, you have several of them. But in particular, I'm talking about uh, discoverpermaculture.com. There's a four part masterclass series that you can take there for free. And uh, stay in touch with Jeff. Definitely get on his YouTube, things like that. Is there anything you got coming up that you want people to know about or anything you want to add in here where people can get more information? <laughs> well, believe it or not, I am teaching an on, uh, a face-to-face -face PDC here at St. Tuna Farm. In right now. Um, uh, no, in the next few, uh, I think it's, I don't know, you'll have to look at the website. I don't do schedules, but I think it's June or July. We're here. We're doing one face-to-face -face PDC in Australia, and we're doing one in the Middle East. Okay. Right? So there are two face-to-face -face PDCs. I'm doing one here and one in Jordan. I think the one in Jordan is October, and the one here is July, June, July. Um, otherwise, we'll be releasing our online course again pretty soon. I haven't got a date, I'm afraid, but our online course is pretty special nowadays because we've stacked it with more and more function and more and more information. And you only have to see the endorsements to see what people say about that. It's an 18 week uh, cohort course where you take it every week for 18 weeks. Uh, it's very, very specially done. It's a very special event. Um, those are the main things. I mean, otherwise we share as much as we can on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Um, 
But um, Zaytuna Farm has one course a year that I teach. Other teachers teach otherwise. And, um, and Green in the Desert has one course a year that I teach. Otherwise, other teachers are teaching. Um, and that's it. I'm trying not to do so many face-to-face -face courses, but they keep talking me into it. Um, the online courses, I can see from the online courses the results of the students. I can see. I mean, there's no other testament. What do the students do? How quickly do they become teachers? How quickly do they become good professional consultants? And the online course is way ahead on its ability to educate. But you don't get my sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me being silly and playing up and 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 uh, you know mucking up and admitting that I'm not, not always right. Um, you know, everything's pretty good on the online course. It's it's a very serious education, um, but you know we're in a serious world. One one of the things I've lifted from you when I do presentations or anything, I, I I've kind of lifted your clapping in your one two three and you get everybody to clap wakes them up. But I, I, since I did all the work with the Ducks over the years and did the Duck Chronicles series, I make them say Duck the System when they clap in. It's a triple entendre. Uh, <laughs> but I always give you credit for that when I do that, right? Uh, but uh, I, I do have a few questions for you. We can hit real quick, kind of lightning round style before we go. Uh, K-Bonk says, any sites in South America you're considering for study or development? Well, like you I, haven't I, been to I, enough continents, Jeff. You need to add another one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent quite a bit of time. My first course overseas was in, in that I taught was in Ecuador. Um, I was teaching with the late um, Scott Pittman on that course um, in the Amazon. And then I worked with Ali Sharif, who's also the late Ari, Ali Sharif in, um, in uh, Peruvian Amazon with the Shipibo Indians. That was amazing. I love to go back and do that. Um, and then I was in Guatemala um, with Ronnie Lecker Jot in um in uh, Lake Atalan, again, never been back. They just took off. Um, I did some courses in Costa Rica. I did some courses in in, in Mexico. Um, haven't done any courses further south. Um, so I, I couldn't say there are at the moment uh, because my 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 circuit has been pulling me through mostly uh, towards the Middle East. Um, but there are things I'd like to go back and see. I'd definitely love to go back and see the uh, Shipibo Indians in the Peruvian Amazon. I'd like to know where they're up to. Um, but you can see it online. Um, there's lots of good work going on all through South America, all the way down to Chile. Griffin Hope is down there. He's got a, he's got a Chilean name now. But Griffin Hope is a charger of New Zealand young lad who, who married someone from lady from Chile, doing great work. And Argent Argentina's got the conference. I've got an Argentinian, Argentinian uh, woofer here at the moment. He's great. Fantastic worker. I think he was in uh, your compost video where you were trying to make compost yeah. in like 12 days he's or going, something like that. The guy with the muscles. He's, yeah. in, he's in Bali right now extending his visa. And I've got a Swedish uh, worker here at the moment. He's also great, but he was tuned up by the Argentinian. Um, but, yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be against it. Big place. Just the word South America. <laughs> yeah, it's massive. Uh, you know, the Brazilian uh, Brazilian side alone is 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 just enormous. But they have some great great people there too. Yeah, but I wouldn't say no to another trip. I suppose. I spent uh, a few years in Central America, Panama and Honduras mostly, and I didn't know what I know now. I was in the military at the time, and. Uh, but I, I look back at that and go like Panama, everything grew everywhere. Like it, it, nobody doing it on purpose. Like it, it's like it must be one of the easiest places in the world to grow food. We we would be running in formation when I was in service, you know, and you'd run by a mango tree when it ripened and it would reek from rotting fruit because nobody would pick it up. Yeah. And it was it, and it was because they were everywhere. Like the little kids would be in the streets. Uh, I don't even know what the proper name from. They called them mamones. They were like, they looked spiky, like a big, like, looked like a a, a sweet a, a sugar a, um, sweet gum ball, except they were like three times as big. You cracked them open, and it looked like a white plum in the middle with a with a seed. And the kids would sell these giant bags of them for like a dollar, 
And the only people who would buy them is the Americans that were in service down there because you'd pay them a dollar to go fill a bag up. It was everywhere. And there was food. Every, like we used to fish in Gantoon Lake. I, I, you, I know you've been there, but if you've, if you've never fished for peacock bass, that's why to go back alone, man. Peacock bass are like large mouths on steroids with genetic mutations. They're massive. And they're stupid. If it shines, they'll hit it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard to even understand. And you would see people hungry in those places too. And you're like, it was almost like there was a disconnect between you're surrounded by food that you don't have to do anything for except go get it. I mean, street vendors would sell these giant mud crabs steamed on, you know, for like a buck. And it was, it was like, I kind of missed that opportunity because to learn from it, because I didn't have any, all I was, was a kid that had a garden, you know, garden homestead. I didn't know anything about permaculture back then. This is going back to like 1990. Um, and it's in a fascinating part of the world. It really is. Yeah, very large rainfall. There's hardly any dry sections in Panama. There is an area that's a little bit drier. I haven't been there, but I've been next door in Guatemala. But they have had students um, ask me about Panama because they're from there in the online course. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't get a break. Um, yeah. You know, your day length is six till six, and you, every day you've got to put some work in because it will grow like crazy. Yeah. But people aspire to get, you know, like rice and pasta they, they aspire to have modern um processed food because that's what they see on television they don't realize they're sitting in absolute abundance yeah um, yeah and um it, it it's easy enough then to actually process that food to have even more nutrition um so it's a matter of of, of setting up systems with the right design assess design implement establish and allow it to adjust and then just long-term maintenance I mean, it's the same in every climate, actually. It's just different sequences through the 12-month seasons. You know, you know, you can be in a – people, you know – Eric Tonesmeyer in Holyoke, Massachusetts, where you get two foot of snow every year, trialed 300 perennial vegetables and food plants, 300, 300 perennial food plants and settled on the best 200. Well, you get two foot of snow every year. Obviously, you're only growing for six months. You've got six months off. But the six months you're growing, you're doing some pretty long hours. But you're making sure you're storing and processing food. It's like Richard Perkins goes on about latitude 60 in, in Sweden. Yeah, sure. With a 90-day growing season, 120 days maximum, I'd like to have 200 days off as well. <laughs> but i know in that 120 days he's working 18 hours yeah yeah but and it's light for 18 hours too right because and then you have time to write a book why don't yeah. people write many books in the tropics because you're working every day you're, right? working every you're day. not working long hours but you've got to stay on it because turn yeah. around and the weeds are doing a meter a minute yeah yeah and that's a lot of organic matter where you know you go into a cold climate you get a lot of storage in the soils but you can't miss the season. You've got to get that season dead right. A little bit of appropriate technology, a few glass houses, you know, things that start things early, finish things late. It, it's just horses for courses. So I, I often say to people, don't, like, what do you aspire to do in this landscape? Do you know this climate? That's what I said to the guys in this Chilean desert. It's like, yeah. do you know where you are? Do you know what you just bought? And they did. I said, okay. okay. Great. You know what you bought. All right. Now I'm designing something where you're going to realize this is probably what you're going to get. You're not expecting to get something you're not going to be able to get. That's where people go astray. It's like yeah. let's get, let's 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 really understand what we're going to get in this particular climate and the landscape, and then let's go for it. We can create abundance anywhere. Doesn't matter. Like don't don't expect the wrong thing. Well, I appreciate you getting up first thing in the morning. I know you were already speaking before this at six in the morning. So thank you for doing that, Jeff. I appreciate you being with us today. Uh, as I've always said the door is always open for anything you ever want to come on and talk about. Just let me know. And uh, I want people that are listening to this live to know that the audio, again, this is unusual for my show. Usually the audio is out 30 minutes after the video. Because I had you on late in the day, this show will run as an audio podcast tomorrow. In that audio podcast, there will be links to everything that Jeff has that we talked about today. And there's a link to find that when it goes live. It'll be like 8 o'clock in the morning our time tomorrow. Uh, that'll go out. And because uh, I got 
I got work to do. It's my growing time, right? So I got to get out there and, and do some work myself. And I did hear, hear my wife get home while we were talking. So I'll get that up tomorrow. Jeff, thank you so much. And if there's anything you want to say before we, we sign off, you, you have final word. Oh, no worries. Like if people want to hear me or want me to go over there and do a visit, let me know. Let Jack know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I can stack them, bro. We'll do something. Uh, with that, guys, take care. I will catch you uh, Monday with a new show.